You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Moritz Siebert, and I, Niels Kostoblasen, are excited to be back with you on this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, where we're going to discuss last week's events in the world of rule-based investing and take some of your questions. So good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Moritz. How are you? Good morning, Niels. Fine. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. Very well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm stateside this week, so I'm in the same time zone as Jerry, which, uh, which really makes it uh, a good morning at the time of this recording, for sure. Um, interesting week, another interesting week, I think, uh, both in the markets and certainly in um, sort of the trend-following uh, world. So why don't we talk a little bit about it? I, I think maybe if I just uh, sort of start out from memory, um, on the week itself, not a lot of changed uh, on our side in terms of returns, a little bit down, but nothing nothing too dramatic. But interweek, there certainly was uh, a few interesting days, bit of recovery in the beginning of the week. And then uh, as soon as we finished, um, quote unquote, Red October, uh, nicely coined by you, Moritz. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, and by the way, if they haven't found that submarine, we definitely know where Red October was uh, this year. Um, but um, no, but November one uh, Thursday uh, was an interesting day where, uh, despite lots of diversification in in our portfolio, there was no diversification to be seen. And so maybe that's the theme we can talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's really sort of roughly what I. What I remember from being, um, you know, outside my normal um, environment and, and not having necessarily all my reports uh, at hand. Um, what about you, Morris and Jerry? How how was how was your week? A bit down. Um, I must say, I was uh, I was off in this past week. I uh, wanted to refresh my mind, and so I didn't um, didn't follow the markets too closely. Uh, just kind of like you know, from uh, from afar, so to say, but. I think the week was down about a percent or so, um, a lot calmer, calmer than the week before. Um, sure. and, um, I, I haven't really seen like any, uh, outsized returns from any markets. I, I think I would have spotted th those, those, um, so it seems to have been relatively quiet. Yeah. Yeah. What did uh, you notice, sir, uh, Jerry? Well, I think we still have, um, <clears throat> So volatility in the stock market, of course. I, at one point during the week, I thought my um, idea last week's show that don't be so happy with your shorts in the stocks was really going to be a great uh, call. But um, we had a little sell-off on Friday. But yeah, I guess I'm happy with that a little long maybe in the stocks still. And I guess Wednesday, Thursday was a bad day when all the shorts rallied. Not a lot, uh, given uh, the recent profits in those same shorts. So we just got to stay um, disciplined with that. Those trades still look really good. They're all pretty, the dollar, the shorts currency still look good. Uh, they're pretty close to the lows, but uncomfortable. I guess thir this Thursday, yeah. Wednesday or Thursday rally, whatever day it was, um, energy, crude and heating oil unleaded, keep selling off. That's not fun. So still, still staying with the positions, even though uh, some of those days the diversification doesn't really pay off. It seems the longs and the shorts can be correlated to each other. All the longs, all the shorts rallied that one day, and uh, it's great to have diversification, but it's, sometimes it doesn't work. No, no, absolutely. That was a, uh, 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 an important reminder, I guess, that you can have these days where everything seems to be uh, going against you. Um, uh, luckily, they don't happen too too often. And uh, yeah, no, I agree. It's certainly a lot of uh, volatility in equities. And, you know, when you look at some of the uh, equity markets around the world, I know we're feeling the pain as a trend following industry this year and, you know, being down, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, uh, I think nowadays with, with a lot of managers in that space but I mean if you look at some of the European equities they're certainly down 20% uh, from from recent highs and uh, some of the single stocks which have been stars um, you know like Amazon that's probably down I don't know 30% from its high as well so you know there is generally a lot more volatility than what we've been used to um, which over time should be 
hopefully something we can all use uh, in a productive uh, way. Um, like you, Moritz, I didn't necessarily pick up on any major trend changes. I saw it more as a, a very noisy uh, week. Um, so maybe there's not uh, a lot to talk about uh, in in that sense. Um, what about um, sort of interesting news and, and articles? I know we've talked a little bit about, maybe I'll just jump uh, in here with something that I picked up on the way over flying over yesterday uh, from an interview with Chris Cole from Artemis Capital, who has done some really interesting um, reports uh, in, in the volatility space, where he talked a little bit about uh, the February event. Now we've had probably two events you can talk about it in, uh, this year, um, but they're different, I think, in in some ways. Um, but he was focusing. This interview was done before the the uh, October uh, most recent event. But he talked a lot about February um, as not being a volatility event. Event, and I think a lot of people, um, you know, including myself, really. Um, we're looking at this as quote unquote a volatility event because we were focusing on the fact that the VIX went up by 100 percent in in no time. But he was talking about this as being much more of a uh, liquidity event, uh, which I thought at, at when when I heard the first time uh, I thought, wow, that's interesting uh, in 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 some ways. And he went on to explain that when you looked at some of some of the fixed strike option prices uh, in, in the equity space in January and February, he, according to his analysis, um, they, they were actually moving a lot more in January than they were in February. So what caused the February event in his mind was really people who realized that they had to get out um, and needed to get some protection. And there was just no liquidity to be found, uh, even moving 100 lots of, of S&P became a problem, which is, you know, you think a hundred lots is nothing. So I thought that's an interesting, uh, I thought that was an interesting topic conversation. I'm not sure that it's fully appreciated by many people, uh, if indeed it is true. And I think, Jerry, uh, before we started, you talked a little bit about that. That's something you've heard as well. And um, and so uh, I think it, it adds another dimension of the risk spectrum, uh, maybe the hidden risks that we don't talk about that often. And where uh, many strategies potentially are reliant a lot more on liquidity, risk, uh, liquidity, um, but it's something that might not, uh, you know, come up a lot in 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 you know general due diligence conversations, because you take it for granted, right, that these markets are liquid uh, because they are maybe ninety nine percent of the time they're super liquid, um, but when you really need it, that's where liquidity is important. So that was a little bit of a rambling for me. Anything that you Want to comment on that or add to that? Maybe you've heard something similar or not. Well, it's definitely confusing. Um, I mean, to some degree, just listening to what you just said, I'm thinking that, well, is that all the same thing? Is is the lack of liquidity, that, is this what's driving the, the volatility or vice versa? They're, they've got to be connected in some way. Um, people get afraid and the algos go away and so there's nothing on the bid or there's nothing on the offer. Uh, this creates more volatility and it creates fear and, it, and people start wanting to sell more. So I'm not sure yeah. if it's two different subjects or if, he, if that's a really profound insight that he had. Um, liquidity goes away and uh, that creates more, more activity probably to reduce risk, which creates more risk. De-risking yeah. is the term that um, I, I hear a lot. These are de-risking trades, <laughs> and they look <laughs> awfully risky to me. Uh, and then I think one of the benefits of trading the long-term strategy, in my mind, is that, you know, this is just, this sort of junk crap happens a lot. And I want to, whatever happens above my exit, my long-term trailing stop, breakout, or moving average, then I can ignore that. It's just noise. It's going up. It's going down. They're doing all these crazy trades. And as long as I can just stay out of the fray, and when sanity comes back in and real trading, uh, not technical trading, let's say, if, if one can yeah. even identify the differences, uh, then I'll be okay. But these sell-offs get so violent in some of these markets, and I'm trading single stocks, so I'm insulated a little bit because I still have quite a few longs that uh, did exactly that. They had a lot of volatility above the trailing stop. Yeah. And, uh, that stuff stopped. I never got stopped out. So, But eventually, I'll get hit too. And it'll be yeah. irrational, and I'll have to get right back in at the highs again. So it's 
it's definitely something that maybe the data that we back test over the past 30 years doesn't have as much of that craziness in it uh, yeah. as it has recently. I would love to hear your view as well, Mart, if you have one. But before that, I just want to. Uh, so I was reviewing some old transcripts of previous conversations I've had uh, over the years on the podcast, and one of them uh, was with Covenant Covenant Capital, which is probably mm -hmm. one of the longest term managers that I've come across, uh, where they only you know look at data or weekly signals, uh, so weekly data for their signals. But it kind of goes back to your point, Jerry, that. It's certainly one way of trying to stay out of this uh, crazy noise that happens from time to time um, by, you know, focusing on a on a much longer uh, t time frame. Anything on your side, Moritz, in in this respect, or yes, yeah, so we... in terms of liquidity, um, it really seems that February has been less liquid than uh, than the other month, and I think what Chris Cole has has mentioned there is also that. On that day, uh, you know, in, in early February, um, you had a lot of these ETPs becoming forced buyers of VIX futures contracts, and that became a very illiquid market at that point in time. I'm not so sure about the E-minis, um, the S&P that is. Um, I follow some of the stats of Nanex, mm -hmm. and it seems to be uh, in that same ballpark. They said February has been relatively illiquid as far as E-minis are concerned. Um, by contrast though, October has been relatively liquid. Um, yeah. Now, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't look at the, you know, second, third, or you know, lower levels of the order book um, for for my trading. I have no real dependency there or, or trading strategies that rely on that. But one thing that I um, mentioned in one of our earlier conversations, and and what I'd like to complete before the end of the year is is some, you know, update of my slippage analysis uh, for you know, 2018 and see if that has really deteriorated compared to 17, 16, 2015. Um, once I've done that, I'm, I'll be happy to let you know the results. Sure. Um, my feeling is that uh, it hasn't really changed that much as far as I'm concerned or as far as my and trading is concerned. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about slippage like that, do you just take it on aggregate all the markets you trade or do you actually... Um, no, I look at it market by market. Yeah, you break it down market by market. So, yeah. so there might be some more slippage in, say, equities, but there may be less in elsewhere. And, and that's what you mean when you say it may not have changed a lot, but individual markets may have changed. Exactly. I want to see if some of the individual markets have changed and if that change is meaningful. I mean, of course, it changes every year a bit up and down. It's, it's a volatile thing itself. But, yeah. you know, I want to be on the lookout if, if really those numbers have deteriorated um, quite, you know, considerably in one market. Or in a couple sure. of markets, and if they yeah. have, then you know I need to take a deeper dive into that. But like I said, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it is the case. But you know, yeah. better safe than sorry. So I'll look at it. But maybe if we're a little bit um, caught in it about these things, I can certainly talk to our trading desk, and and maybe Jerry, you could t t talk to your trading desk, and maybe we do a little slippage episode and see whether we find anything interesting. I think that's a great uh, great topic. But I, th I think that um, it's just a situation, especially in, let's say, uh, October and February, that it's it's days or hours we're talking about. <clears throat> so yeah. if, if you did no trades that day, then you had sure. no slippage. Oh, but let me tell yeah. you, there was some slippage there, uh, some massive yeah. slippage. And so I think that the numbers can be uh, overly pessimistic or overly optimistic uh, in situations where there is a crash and then a day later, two days later, oh, we're back to kind of normal. October was good. Uh, uh I don't care about October. I care about a day, a hour, yeah. the two or three days that I had to, uh, you know, maybe do some trades. And then, okay, now we're kind of back to normal, uh, sort of. So I think this is a problem. Um, and this is what lends people to think, you know, this is not really real. This is kind of fake stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> but maybe not, you know, it could be. A precursor to a real big bear market. So I guess all will be forgiven uh, for the October slam, but I don't think anything should be forgiven about February. Uh, there needs to be, yeah. and if, you know, if CTAs are not doing this and it's, they're responsible. Uh, when it happened in February, AQR came out with a letter uh, talking about it and Bridgewater said they weren't guilty. So maybe some of the trend people who manage many, many billions, hey, they could do the same thing. Trust me. 
it was not us. We're smarter than that. We're at least as smart as Jerry, and we don't try to sell 10,000 S&Ps on a, when the bid is 50. I mean, something simple like that would make people feel a little bit better about the legitimacy of the markets. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and I think it's an important discussion because I think you're right. I mean, these two events in, in, in the bigger scheme of things, I mean, they're relatively, you know, small, even though they've been painful uh, if you're on the wrong side of it, for sure. But if we're going to have something much bigger, much greater that lasts for a much longer period of time, then this kind of risk is something that all trading strategies or investment strategies needs to deal with in a much more meaningful way. Um, and um, so, yeah, I do think it's interesting for sure. Uh, you know, one of uh, your interviews that I really, really enjoyed was with the guy from uh, Herald. Oh, yeah, Herald from, from, from uh, TransTrend. Yeah. Yes, it was amazing. And then so I'm scouring his website and his news monthly newsletter. There's just so much good stuff on there. I really love those guys. And um, I had something pinned on my Twitter. My pinned tweet was, I, I'll have to paraphrase it, but it was really funny you know, to me. It was funny. It was something like uh, vol targeting the uh, the best kind of risk management as long as you don't ever need it. Something like that. So <laughs> it's in theory, it's just fantastic. Don't try, sure. to, yeah, don't try to implement it. Yeah. But I think, but couldn't that be said about other things in 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 a sense that there are just certain things where you can't, um, where it works ninety nine percent of the time, right, or ninety nine point nine percent of the time, but that there's this one zero point one percent of the time where it just doesn't work, and and it's a big risk. But I wonder whether we can, can we? I don't know that we can eliminate all kinds of risks. Do you know what I mean? I mean, maybe we have to settle for yeah, it works ninety nine percent of the time, but there will be one time where you really get into trouble. But hey, that's well. This is a new know. kind of risk that, in my opinion, was created out of thin air. It never was risky before to have a monster profit, and uh, that you've held on to for a year, let's say, and then as the vol increases you have to do a radical reduction in your position. And right. this was, uh, now the risk that I always heard about, I'm being a little facetious here, was uh, the small loss. We have to take uh, a few ATR losses on a trade and risk 50 basis points. And if it goes against us, we have the, built, we have the predetermined stop, predetermined loss. But once we have a big, huge trade, uh, this is what trend followers do. They make a lot on five or 10% of their trades and we're going to maximize that profit. And, it's, and when, towards the end, when the market, you know, gets uh, the end of the trend, maybe we'll see some volatility. We'll give back a fair amount, but we'll have made a lot of money. Oh, we have a new risk now, which is, Oh, the ATR was X. Now it's two yeah. X. I have to reduce my trade. Really? I mean, it's, it's a great trade. Oh no, it's, it's yeah. this extra risk now. <clears throat> and then the back test that, um, that w that was done on this particular strategy did not include that type of trading. So I think this is another issue that yeah. <clears throat> in, in testing and research, your own ideas can have an impact on the market. I think that's a very, very good point. A uh, great point actually. And, and, and not to uh, only quote uh, Chris Cole this time, but it's just happened that I was listening to him uh, on the plane over. He made a, a point about that uh, as well. I think, or at least I think he made a point about that. <laughs> Let me not uh, talk on his behalf. And that is the fact that volatility has become, it's gone from a statistics that we could look at to now becoming a player on the team, right? So now it's part of what we do. And that changes the game when you put it on the field, so to speak, and it becomes part, as you would say, as you just said, uh, Jerry, if suddenly you have to adjust because of changes in volatility, instead of just observing the fact that the volatility had, had changed. And he uses an example of, um, you know, if, if we imagine a world with self-driving cars, so, so right now we, we may have limits on, on the highways at 70 miles an hour. But because self-driving cars will be so much more efficient, they'll be safer, and all this technology will make crashes uh, much less likely, we should we can put up the speed limit to 120, 130 maybe, and it should be fine. But the problem, of course, is that when something does happen, then the impact of such a crash, crash is so much bigger. And, and I think that's what he... Um, you know, relates back to to the markets that now that we're using volatility as 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 a as a factor in our models and 
and it's a player on on the team, so to speak, then once we and and it may work for as you say ninety nine percent of the time, but when it doesn't work and it's suddenly a part of the game, the impact of that fallout will be so much bigger if that makes sense. Jerry, top tweets, top tweets. How are we doing on that this week? Any good ones? Um, well, we had some some uh, interesting um, things here to talk about. Um, just uh, briefly, I would say um, I retweeted a quote from a or a chart from an old AQR study about. Um, time series momentum during the 10 worst drawdowns for 6040 a lot of interest in this so and it just made me think that yes this is exactly how we used to look at it in the 90s when i started trading um how did ctas do over a bad period for stocks or stocks and bonds you know a one or two or three year period this is how we kind of added value and this is what happens to your portfolio uh, the return risk it improves if you add 10 or 20% CTAs to your stocks and bonds. And I thought how unfortunate we have gone from that to crisis alpha. And, right, right, uh, yeah. Today, in October, in February. Um, <clears throat> and after a big, huge trend, I, we, we, uh, we laughed last week, well, where was that crisis? It was a crisis for a few days, but CTAs really did and can add value to a what is a real crisis, um, big drawdowns in the, in the stocks and bonds that last over a few years, but uh, we'll leave the short-term traders to take care of the the daily crises. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. It's, um, it's, an important, um, it's an important point, and it's how – it's really what – to me, that's how the narrative has changed, right? I mean, and, and, and I don't know whether it's because we, in the 90s, we hardly had internet and information flow was, you know, slow. Um, so, so maybe we didn't focus so much on these, you know, short term time frames. But nowadays, everything seems to be instant. And, and therefore, the focus is almost, you know, did you hedge me from two o'clock to three o'clock today because the S&P went down by 3% or something like that? I mean, it's it's a very different narrative. Um, and maybe we need to do more to go back to the old narrative. That's yeah, right. Well, if you find any manager that hatches us from 2 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, let me know. I'd like to have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And another... Um, I guess the top tweet of the week was a very simple um, reminder that don't average losing positions. Uh, there was a quote somewhere I got that says the classic strategy of dollar cost averaging is a smart approach. And uh, then I came back with a snarky comment. I don't care how classic it is. Adding to losers creates adding to losing positions creates losers. And, you know, people just love that because we're all so uh, dedicated to that st overall strategy of small losses, large winners. Uh, and so that was the number one uh, good old faithful exactly. uh, tr classic trend following idea. It reminds yeah. me of Paul Tudor Jones, losers, average losers. Yeah, he said, classic that is, yes. but that's what yes. he said. I think that was the picture he had in his office and it's a great one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Um, then... I, uh, my favorite three tweets, I'm going to pull them all together, I guess, uh, sure. was this idea that we talked about a little bit last week with uh, Bill Eckhart in his interview. Um, it goes, mechanical trading with a safety net of rare human overrides is the best approach. Um, it's better to trade closer to the size that you like than if risk rises above a threshold, manually override which sounds like a contradiction for the three of us, because if we go with that, we, we definitely think we should follow our system. Um, but I can definitely see that I probably agree with that. No, no shock there that um, one should not worry too much that uh, there was another quote, uh, something like, if, if you really truly believe in your system, you should not deleverage during a drawdown. And I thought, well, 
I think uh, I'm going to have to go with Bill Eckhart on this and sort of uh, with the idea that we're following these systems, but this is not a religion. This is uh, serious. It's we, we, we have a goal of capital preservation and preserving capital during bad periods. And we just have to, even though we've, we believe in what we do, we have to leave open the possibility that it may not work very well. And we may see markets and bad periods like, like we've never seen before and give ourselves an out in order to preserve our capital and live to play another day. Uh, well, well-worn cliche, but it's sort of true that, um, I don't think that it's a bad thing to trade smaller. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. And I've said it before, trading smaller and reducing risk um, allows one to continue to be disciplined and to do the same trades uh, just in a smaller way until uh, I feel better about this, uh, my, you know, my current situation and the drawdown kind of stops. Um, and then there was the third part to this, which is uh, – a study that I had seen before and tweeted before, but I, for some reason, did it again. And uh, it was a supposedly a study where one of the conclusions were was that people were more likely to use an algorithm and accept its errors if given the opportunity to modify the algorithm themselves, even if it meant make, making it perform imperfectly. So I think that, yes, we're going to make less money if we have these overrides, probably. We're probably going to be better off following the system and not having to or not uh, reducing the risk at some point in time, but it may save us as well. So I think that it's sort of like the car. I've also heard, read uh, studies on the self-driving cars where people like them more if they have a brake or if they can override. You know, and So I think we, we just need to make peace with technology and algos and try to find a way to stay disciplined and allow the algorithms and the rules to do what they're supposed to do, but also allow us to continue to do that by giving us a little bit of power over them when it looks like that they're imperfect and they're going to fail just like we would. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's a very fundamental point you bring up, uh, you know, a discussion I think that has been, you know, really framed that if you use uh you know, just one percent of of override uh, in your uh, in your methodology, you you are no longer systematic. I mean, that's how I think some of these discussions have been framed in in the past. But uh, I, I see your point uh, in 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 many ways. I wonder whether still um, some of these things should be um, systematized. You know, if possible, um, so that again. You don't. If I think for me, there's a big distinction between are we doing it based on human emotions or are we doing it based on rules? And I don't think that there's anything wrong with trading smaller in a drawdown if it's based on a rule. But if it's based on a human emotion, because it doesn't feel nice, and and maybe this you know can lead to bigger losses, but maybe not. Then I think we are you know digressing a little bit from our our, our uh, aim of being uh, systematic. Um, and I, I'm not a statistician by no, no means, but my understanding is, of course, that the longer your track record, the longer you trade, the bigger the, the possibility is for, for a bigger drawdown, right? So we often hear that the, our biggest drawdown is probably ahead of us, which is probably true. If we trade for another 50 years, we might have a bigger drawdown than we've had in the last 45 years or 30 years, whatever. So, you know, so, so do we accept that, so to speak? I mean, do we accept that we should always, tr or do, we, we, do we try to always um, have smaller drawdowns in the future or do we accept what the stats, stats says? And that is that if you go on with a much longer time frame, there's a, there's a likelihood, a high likelihood that you're going to have a bigger drawdown than, than, than not. I think these are very important discussions. I'm not uh, saying what's right or, or wrong, but I'm just saying that I, to me, if, if we start uh, deviating away from using rules for everything, then we are flirting with with a new territory. Um, but by the way, uh, because I used to work with a firm like that where there was rules, but with a discretionary overlay, and I, I think it is a discretionary overlay, even if it could also be based on some rules, but if you don't apply them consistently, then it's kind of discretion. And uh, so I've seen it work. 
I just don't think it works necessarily for everyone um, to to start applying these things. Um, and um, it certainly makes it more uh, difficult for investors to analyze um, compared to a fully systematized uh, uh, strategy. But maybe it's a hybrid, which, you know, there's always new ways of doing things. And, and we should not be stuck in, as you say, it's not a religion. So we should op be open to doing it differently for sure. Um, but I think for me, it's more of a third category than, than discretionary and systematic. This is kind of a hybrid of that. What do you think, Moritz? I agree with that. I mean, um, look, we, we are making changes to our systems. Uh, you've mentioned that in one of the past episodes that Dunn has made a couple of major changes in 2007, 2008, or somewhere around that, that point in time. Yeah, 2006 and 2013. Absolutely. Six yeah. and 13, right? So. Yeah. Um, looking back at, at my systems, I do make changes to those, but the thing is it, it stays trend following, um, the changes don't make the system, you know, become a mean reverting system or like fundamentally change the way it works. So I still think it is systematic, right? If somebody looked at that and had a problem with analyzing it saying, well, that's now a discretionary system because you're making changes. Well. What can it no, really I think you're missing to... my point here, Moritz. Uh, just to, for me to be clear, I don't talk about. I'm not talk, referring to research changes where yeah, yeah. clearly no, you no, do no, a I... research project, you make a change. I'm talking about during your trading. Okay. Yeah, then you yeah, suddenly yeah, okay. decide okay. to reduce. I'll get yeah. to that, right? So, yeah. so you have that thing, and you know you implement it, you follow it, and then what I don't really want to do, and I sit with with Jerry there on rather trades smaller than larger, is come into a situation, come to a point where there's so much stress in that system or emotionally or both that you're at that breaking point and then you feel you want to make a change to that system because i you know without being able to prove it but i would say that the odds are that you're making a change to a system at exactly the worst point in time you're making a change at a time during which you are in duress, the system is in a drawdown, you can't take the pain anymore, you don't want to take, maybe you can't take, but you don't want to take the pain anymore. You, you just feel like you need to change something. And the changes that you make then because you trade your equity curve, I just be very careful. I think they're dangerous. Um, and so the I think that the core recipe should be to trade small enough so that you can live through that drawdown. Um, and yes, you know, the larger drawdown may be the one ahead of us, but live through that drawdown, be able to, you know, to go through it and come back out of it. I know it takes a lot of time sometimes, and that can be extremely hard um, on investors, on yourself, but it is important. I don't, I haven't found it at least, I haven't found the way to eliminate that, that risk. I think it's it's part of the method. It's part of the PL that we make. Um, and and so those overrides, I, I'm not sure. I, I definitely don't want to make any overrides in a situation of stress and pain. Um, and you know, I think that that is what I wanted to say, Niels, is that the overrides as part of the normal research process, well, fine, right? Yeah, I agree. They may be in a in a period of a slight drawdown, they may be when you make a new all-time high even, right? But I mean, this is this is just what we do. Um, sure. Yeah, and I th uh, this is a little bit different idea, I think, but <clears throat> uh, this week when I saw that some October numbers, um, I just thought about the conversation we've had, I think last week, which was, uh, you know, the stock market is an 8% return, basically, the, the S&P and then a 50% plus drawdown. And I got to thinking, like, why am I not trying to make 8%? And I don't think there's a lot of CTAs or hedge funds. Maybe I'm wrong, but are really saying, look, I'm going to try to make 8%. So when a bad month gets compared to a typical bad month for a, the stock market, it'll look somewhat yeah. similar. But it just seems like that some, some of us uh, can post some really large numbers, and uh, plus and minus, and it really just people are going, what are you guys doing? Uh, Oh, don't don't worry. We're going to make a lot of money. Well, I know you've been saying that for a while, and so the volatility itself um, puts pressure on us, puts pressure on the clients. Uh, you know, 
and it's self-imposed to some degree because look, if you're trying to make 12 or 15, live with it, and that's going to be life. It's going to be more volatile than the stock market that's going to make seven or eight. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I think that's a great point. And I think that this is where, to some extent, I, I do see that there is a bit of a double standard, the way people look at equities and the way people look at alternatives and certainly, you know, trend followers. I mean, I think we are held up to a, lot, a higher standard when it comes to you're not allowed to have, you know, drawdowns bigger than this, but we still want you to outperform and we want you to make money when the equities goes down and so on and so on and so forth. I mean, there are a lot of things we have to to deliver uh, as as a strategy, uh, which is, um, you know, may, and, and this is certainly on, on, on my part, this is why I really try and make the distinction to people about we're not a hedge, we're an uncorrelated return stream, but it does mean that we sometimes will be correlated and sometimes we will be negatively correlated, you know. Anything else we want to add to this or do we want to jump into some of the questions for the week? Maybe just uh, just one point on those um, overrides and the drawdown. I, I mean, just just to put some background onto that, I'm just you know um, reminiscing about the own PNL there. I mean, there are drawdowns that take super super long, and it takes just uh, feels like an eternity to get out of them, right? And then you have those drawdowns, and and I remember there have been a couple that you know even even though the larger drawdowns. And those were recovered in three to four weeks, like super, super fast, right? Maybe even quicker. And mm. um, so, you know, had I made any changes to the system at the point of maximum drawdown, then I probably wouldn't have been able to get out of that that fast. And that felt really good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's another great point, actually, that, you know, point about recoveries, right? That, that we shouldn't underestimate that very often, even after a long drawdown, the recovery period can be super short. Yes. And so what does that do if we start fiddling around with, with, with the systems? Um, I would imagine that would change uh, the recovery periods as well, of course, exactly. and that could change the whole drawdown profile. And, and my contention is that um, the S&P... 500 is a system. It, it has rules. It may be yeah, a little bit of trend sure. following rules. It keeps adding to winners and uh, de-emphasizing the stocks that are lagging behind. <clears throat> yeah. So it doesn't get out. <laughs> so <laughs> at the worst possible 50 plus percent drawdown that I keep mentioning to make sure this is getting in everyone's head, it's an yeah. 8% return and a 50% drawdown plus. Well, the reason it's an eight percent is because at the worst drawdown, it just is fully invested. Does it doesn't? Yeah. Um, and you now we all talk about how well you know this is impossible to accept. This is impossible for people to continue keeping their money in in this uh, system. But uh, theoretically, you know, this is the papers and the articles are written as if they do, and it has a really good performance because it doesn't do anything. It just stays yeah. with it. And you can add to that, Jerry, that I think that when they are in that 50% drawdown, we know that the rebalancing or whatever it's called that comes through, I mean, the the worst performers will be kicked out and we're going to have some new constituents in, in the S&P. And, and, and frankly, we don't know if the ones that are being kicked out would be the ones that are having the greatest recovery, which is very likely afterwards. And, and, and so not only do we have an 8% return strategy with a 50% plus drawdown, it also has drawdowns that have lasted 10 year plus, which has never been the case for any, I think, trend following strategy that is still around. Um, so, yeah. Good. Let me jump to one of uh, the first questions we have here. It's from uh, Kyle. And he says that um, if there is one question I could have you ask your professional guests, that must be you guys, how do they adjust their sector and asset weighting when they're mandated to stay with that asset or sector? In other words, what's the preferred method of dynamically rebalancing a portfolio? I've read Catherine Kaminsky's book on managed futures, and it offers a few good points on this. However, I'm curious, when these early trend followers started their funds, how did they know how to initially balance their systems to avoid blowing up early? I think the answer lies in the type of volatility measures such as ATR, standard deviations, or price from the mean, adding up the basis points of allocation and margin risk, etc. So over to the professional part of the uh, podcast. 
Jerry and Moritz. <laughs> Jerry, I think you should go first. Okay. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So the sec the last part about blowing up, you know, once again, that's going to be a little probably the biggest decision, uh, most important decision any trader can make is the initial choice of leverage. Am I yeah. going to try for 8%, 16%, 28%? You know, what am I going for? Um, it's very difficult to get that wrong in the sense that in the midst of a drawdown, you're not happy with that initial choice and try to come up with ways to not have to pay the piper for trading too large. Uh, so, but I think um, my answer is not very sexy because I set up the portfolio based upon the, whatever weightings I can get the most amount of diversification. So okay, that's uh, so I'm not necessarily going to look at the back test. I'm going to analyze the correlations and things like that, and put in my portfolio weightings per market based upon the correlation. So maybe I'm going to be smaller in the bonds than most people. In my opinion, they're fairly correlated. I'm going to be more commodities, more single stocks, because I can find more diversification there. Not going to pay any attention to historical performance. And I know this correlation and these weightings can change a lot, but I'm going to try to maintain those portfolio weightings forever, never change them, uh, live with the increases and decreases and the fluctuations of the correlations, because one of the most important things about uh, system trading is to uh, – do the same trade every single time. So not only when the moving average crossover happens, I'm always going to buy. And when it goes below, I'm always going to exit. But um, I think it's better also to always trade that particular market the same size for your entire life, for the rest of your career. You know, you know I haven't done this. I'm just saying it's probably better to, to do that and not have to make these changes. Um, so crude and heating oil and unleaded that are pretty much the same market. I'm going to uh, that's going to be reflected in my portfolio weightings. Sometimes they're not. So, oh well, that's the way. That's the way life is. Sure. So let me ask maybe a follow up question on that, um, just to clarify. And and don't you don't have to be specific or anything like that. But just generally, if we're going to help, uh, you know, Kyle on on this question. I mean, how long, say, should a correlation study be because I think we we all agree that correlations change as, as you rightly said and and but maybe they've changed quite dramatically in the last five or ten years because of and you know uh, say an artificial way of monetary policy etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so so how long is enough to to uh, to give you that uh, you know basis for making a decision in terms of that and also do you do you then restrict uh, or allocate risk by sector saying I want to have so much in this sector, but actually whether it's three energy markets or four energy markets, that's not so important because they're more or less the same. So do you think about sectors or do you actually think about, well, I'm going to treat these markets completely individually? I treat them individually and I don't think about sectors or asset classes. I've, I've seen systems where, you know, um, on the brochure, it said we have 25% in equities, 25% in bonds, 25% FX, and 25% in commodities. And it, you know, just for me, I, I don't, I don't work that way. I don't, I don't look at it that way, and I don't look at it at the, in the same way on a sector basis. So it's markets on an individual basis. And to answer his question about the correlations more specifically, I want to look at a very, very long, as long as possible um, correlation between different markets and over different time frames. You know, we can calculate 100 day calculate, uh, correlations, 200 day correlations and so forth. So I want to see changes in, in that behavior. Like have there been periods where, you know, bonds and equities correlated positive, positively, there have been periods where they correlated negatively. How often does that happen? Is that unusual? So those type of things, um, they they influence the the weighting mechanism, if you will. And then also, we you know without wanting wanting to become too technical here, but there are different ways in which calculation uh, correlation can be calculated. I mean, most people use the standard correlation function, which is you know Pearson's correlation, 
which you know essentially also assumes a normal distribution of returns. But there there are different different ways to measure correlation. There's, for instance, the Spearman correlation that takes into account drawdowns, things like that, which I think can be incredibly useful. At least you know they play a role for me. Um, so I look at those type of things, and. And then, like Jerry said, I mean, if, if you have markets that just by, you know, the fact that, you know, they're the same kind of like they, they come from the same barrel, like, you know, the petroleum products, maybe you don't want to give each of them the same weight, but smaller weights, um, you know, um, same, same can be said for the bonds and for some of the currencies, you know, you can trade. Uh, a multiple number of, of currency pairs, but, you know, the, the marginal addition probably isn't going to add that much because it does create overlaps with all sorts of other pairs that you're already trading. So I look at it from, you know, the viewpoint of, I want to have many, many, as many independent bets in that portfolio in independent markets at the same point in time. And that's, that's how I built it up. I, I don't, you know, sectors and asset classes and all that type of stuff. It doesn't, it's not even an, a factor or a parameter in my system. Yeah, the <clears throat> independent. That's that's a great word. I I'll do the same thing. Maybe I'll look at some uh, you know shortcuts, clustering techniques that I will analyze a sector or a group, the European currencies or the energy. Uh, but I, for the most part, when people I think uh, talk about their percentage allocation to a sector, it's a, just a, su a summation of an individual yeah. process. Uh, then, of course, I left out the most important thing, um, which is that um, if if you were to ask me my positions, uh, they're totally determined by the trend. So I love and preach diversification and conservative uh, portfolio weightings, but I could be 100%. My portfolio could be in stocks or could be in bonds because it's the only thing trending. And so that mm -hmm. is the ultimate override. I sort of look at it as if I had every position on, what's the safest portfolio? And since one of my core beliefs is that in the systematic trend following, at least every trade has the same expectation, there's no reason not to be maximally conservative. And go ahead and just say, look, crude, heating oil, unleaded, it's pretty much one market. Um, but because, but also I've lived through at, at least twice where heating oil doubled and crude went up a, a few bucks. And then 1987, yeah. silver had a huge move. It doubled or tripled and gold went up 10 bucks. Uh, I mishandled some of those trades. So they're, they're, I really remember what happened. And, uh, <laughs> and then, so they go right back to being 90% correlated. Uh, yeah. and so let's just, I, my idea is embrace maximum risk silver and gold and platinum they're pretty much the same market because all these trades have the same expectation the longs and the shorts and why not um, you're going to be in situations where they were not correlated very much at all in 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 december 1990 i made 30 percent i made all 30 percent in that month in heating oil and i made 30 percent for the year so that type of uh, trading is no longer exists at my company. <laughs> That's not going to happen again. So I've more embraced the hundreds of markets, lots of small independent bets. And uh, I don't think there's too much of a downside to that. No. And I think just from our side, I think we, we do it more or less the same way. We certainly treat every single market individually. And as Jerry says, we also, you know, the overriding factor is the signal strength of each individual market. But we do look at correlations and maybe we look at correlations in a slightly different way. I don't think I mean, our correlations are not just we look at it once uh, over a very long period of time. I do know that we use, you know, dynamic uh, correlations over time. But uh, to what extent it's, it's, you know, the principles of what we've just discussed, we I think we see that pretty similarly. Now, then the next question we have is from Dave in Minnesota. And, um, and and it certainly seems to be a theme this week, which is very interesting because these are some of the topics we've already touched upon. But that's good that we have questions then following on to that. So, um, so, so Dave writes, um, please discuss some ideas around ways to reduce risk per trade as equity drawdowns. 
very, uh, you know. And then he goes on to say, I realized the turtles had a method of doing this by reducing risk twice as fast as the account drew down. Can you guys talk specifics about how the turtles implemented this? Are there other methods to consider for reducing risk while a drawdown, um, while in a drawdown that could be considered? So maybe just a little bit of a follow up to our, our earlier conversations. But since this is a specific turtle question, you know, you're in luck, Dave, because you've got the ultimate turtle here to to talk about it. Well, um, I was there. And a lot of people can uh, do just as good, uh, as good a job as I, I can do. But I think that um, that's exactly the way it was. If you're down 10% for the year, let's say, then you reduce your current positions by 20% and your next in, in your trades, your upcoming trades by 20% until you get back to equity highs or something like that. It was not, uh, it was not one of the more things that were more uh, specific rules, but – and so I chose my words carefully, and it didn't sound like it was that specific. It's kind of specific. But I think that was also in a period where our average return was 150% a year, and uh, we were trading sure. really short term. Uh, I have talked to friends recently. and We chat about things like this, and their response is, oh, I never would do that anymore. Uh, Deleveraging de in a drawdown is, is not something I think is a good idea. I deleverage before the drawdown. So – I don't deleverage bef uh, before the drawdown, and, and I think, uh, once again, you're back to this ultimate question. I think it's best to choose a um, a volatility and, and a leverage and a number of risk units you're going to put on that you can live with. So these uh, decisions about should I discretionarily or implement rules that are going to reduce my uh, positions, uh, these happen very, very infrequently. and that is the way to go. And we're back to maybe 8%, 10% return. So you can really enjoy life and live through bad periods and criticism and keep your clients. Um, so I think that's the most important Happier. thing. Happier. Yeah. yeah. Don't get yourself sure. in a situation sure. where you feel like you need to do this on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Anything from your side, Moritz, on this one? Or? Uh, I don't do it that way. It's just, you know, every time a, um, a trade is generated and position sizes are calculated, it takes the most recent account size. That's one way of doing things. So, um, you know, position sizes will, uh, fluctuate with, with the size of the account. Um, um, so I don't kind of like, you know, reduce position sizes twice as fast or something like that. Just stay the course. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Then we have a couple of questions from uh, one of my favorite listeners, Dimitri, who uh, is based in the UK. And he asks, um, I understand that larger time frames are expected to have more influence on price momentum than smaller time frames. But what time frames does a successful systematic trend following fund consider too large? It's probably too long, I would imagine, to be effective. Um, for example, the yearly time frame may be more influential than the monthly time frame, but a lot can be, but a lot can happen in a year in terms of the fundamentals of a company, currency, a commodity. So, would a CCA fund be looking at a quarterly as the largest, most influential time frame, or the monthly, perhaps, or is it? dependent on the instrument being traded. I understand the price is everything, but is there a time frame where fundamentals keep getting in the way of price action, therefore repeatedly screwing expe uh, expectancy? So, I mean, I, let me kick it off this time then with this. I mean, we try at Don not to restrict necessarily the model um, within a certain time frame, meaning we we do want to allow it to look at different time frames, and we do this in a purely systematic way. And it's anywhere from a few weeks, really, up to a couple of years that we think is a reasonable time frame to consider. But then we want the system or the model to really make the choices for us, and we do that actually on a weekly basis now. In the old days, uh, since two thousand six, when we implemented this methodology, we 
could only do it once a month because it's a lot of calculations um, to do this. Um, but nowadays we can do it on a weekly basis. So it doesn't mean that anything will change on a weekly basis, but it just la allows the model to recalibrate itself, so to speak, based on on recent um, e events. Um, but um, what I can say is that it, it never selects anything in the short term time frame because according to our methodology, short term trend following is not as robust nor as successful as medium to long term. So we end up operating in the medium to long term time frame uh, of that spectrum that I that I mentioned, but that's how we do it. Um, so I'll turn it over to you guys. Yeah, I just uh, I look at the research and the parameters and pretty quickly you can you can kind of see that six months to 12 months is a good look back period. I don't think I understood the question as well as I wanted to. I definitely would say it's that. probably the look back. I think it's the look back period, yeah. Jerry, that okay. Dimitri is asking about, you know, is there something where the look back period becomes so long that it's not useful or too short for that matter that it's not useful? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, let's say you looked at a 12 month look back and, it, and you liked it and it was profitable. I think uh, it, and maybe the, the, the 24 month was profitable. Uh, you know, I would just say, well, as long as you're not trading too short term, I don't really see the need to go too long term. The drawdowns are going to be even worse, possibly. Sure. So yeah. um, I like to sort of say, OK, here's as short term as I want to be. Here's as long term as I kind of think I need to be. And um, I'll trade everything in between or lots of parameters in between those two. So six months, nine months, 12 months, I don't know, something like that. So I think. I, but I think part of his question also was, does it depend upon the markets? And once again, I would say, no, we trade all the markets, the longs and the shorts in each market, the same with the same system, same parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything from you, Moritz, on this in terms of time frames that are useful, not so useful? Yeah, um, I haven't. Well, first of all, to answer his questions, I haven't found a uh, a link between the fundamentals and you know the uh, the look back period, so to say. Um, certainly, you can think about you know the bond markets in the past thirty forty years, and you could have traded those with a very very long term trend following system, multi year look back period, and and have a great time with that, right? Um, you know, some of the some of the markets they work really well with, you know, two or three years, even um, maybe four years. Um, it's not what I'm doing, but I'm saying, you know, it, it could work and I think it does work. Um, but pretty much anything between six to, say, 18, 24 months is, uh, is kind of like the sweet spot uh, for me personally. Um, yeah, sure. Cool. Then Dimitri has another question, um, and it comes. It goes like this: What is the typical drawdown percentage point between trusting and sticking with your system, or adjusting your system to current signals of the markets? For example, I've heard it mentioned uh, in the Market Wizards book and also on the Top Traders Unplugged podcast that a fifty percent is uh, a cutoff point. But I've also heard you, Nils, mention that Dan has been through a 50% drawdown before and that it happened right before some of Dan's most successful years. So a question about is there is there such a thing uh, as a percentage where we would say, well, hang on, something is wrong. And I think, again, it goes to some of the talks we've had already on this uh, episode about being comfortable with the drawdowns and adjusting trade sizing accordingly. But... Um, do you want to just elaborate a little bit to give Dimitri some specific um, uh, reply to this particular question? Well, I'd say, again, um, it's difficult because every trader CTA may choose a different leverage point. And so yeah. a 50% drawdown for me might be much worse than for someone else who uh, sure. yeah, has more leverage, more risk, is shooting for higher returns, let's say. So yeah. once again, I think uh, I look at it a little bit differently. What are the opportunities I've seen in the trade in the markets? We've had some choppiness, let's say. How did I handle the choppiness? Was I sh too short term being whipsawed? You've had some really large trends. How did my system handle the those trends? Did I give back too much profit? Did I keep getting bounced out and having to get back in? And so. That's going to worry me maybe more than the drawdown. 
the, itself. Uh, right. If I end the year and have uh, with a twenty percent drawdown, and I'm up forty percent, I'm not really that. You know, that's sure. uh, what did the what opportunities uh, did the markets give us, and how did I handle those opportunities? Um, and, uh, and measuring it against my peers. Maybe I'm too long term. Maybe I'm too yeah. short term. So uh, these are the questions versus the drawdown. The drawdown might be perfectly fine. It's hard to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on your side, Moritz? I uh, don't have a hard cut of point, um, so can't really answer that. Sure. I would say uh, just uh, as an aside, uh, Dimitri, that um, something I learned many years ago. Um, and I think it's a pretty good rule of thumb. It's not meant to be, you know, always correct. But if you look at a manager's track record and you and you calculate their monthly standard deviation of returns, I've always felt that um, as a rule of thumb, five to six times their monthly standard deviation is really a drawdown that you should, should expect to come on a, you know, not every year, but on a reasonably frequent, um, you know, uh, time frame. You you should you should expect a drawdown like that. So again, as Jerry says, it really depends on on what you're shooting for in terms of your returns. Uh, therefore, your volatility and therefore your drawdown will reflect that. Um, but most importantly, um, probably never do something that you're not comfortable of doing because there is a difference being down 20 percent being down 50 percent and the math of course when you're down 50 you need to make 100 percent to be back at at uh, new equity highs and and psychologically and and in terms of really delivering that that's um, that's not so easy so uh, to keep that in mind um final question for today i think we'll take this as the final one this is from uh, robert and um, let's see here, Robert asks, do you typically invest in the front con uh, contract when you receive a new trend signal or are you using proprietary techniques to determine which dated contract to invest in? If the latter, how much do you estimate this adds to your overall uh, performance? Um, I think um, that that's an easy question for all of us to answer. So I'll kick it over to you, Moritz, to begin with. Yeah, I think we had that before. It's in, yeah. in general, it's the front month uh, contract with the exception of uh, some of the short term interest rate futures like, um, you know, Euribor or Euro dollar, where you trade at a different different part of the futures curve um, to, to get more vol volatility essentially from that market. But all the other markets, they are their front month. Yeah, same on your side, Jerry. Yeah, sure. I think, I think so. uh, front month is good. And um, there has been times over the years where maybe I stayed a little longer in the front month or got out of the front month quicker because I was trend following the spread. And uh, there's been some commodity moves where there was a shortages and the front month was much stronger. So I tried to hold on, hold on as long as I could. And um, that's another way of maybe getting a little bit of extra profit to trend follow the, you know, the, the spread actually. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I would just uh, finally add, Robert, to this, that uh, on our side, I would say the only uh, market where we do uh, look a little bit further out is when we talk about the, the VIX and the volatility space um, where we, we have, you know, and it's not really a trend following model. So, but I just want to mention that because you may have heard that come up. And then finally, just to add to what uh, Morris was saying about the short-term interest rate contracts, at least from my perspective, historically, a lot of managers were looking about around nine months. Uh, so if we're now uh, sort of trading December uh, 2018, then for the short-term interest rate contracts, we would probably be looking at September 2019. However, when interest rates went pretty much to zero, I know that a lot of manager had to adjust that because the the even the nine month contract was kind of you know nothing happened it was completely flat and 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 so on and so forth, so I think nowadays you'll find that in a low interest rate environment that uh, has been extended maybe even to a couple of years out, um, because liquidity is pretty good anyway. So uh, just just to add that to to that question but thanks again to all of you for these questions they are great for us to uh, dive into and we really encourage you to keep them coming um just from a, a little update point of view as we normally do on uh, on our podcast series talk a little bit about performance and again 
as we record these episodes over the weekend. Um, this is as of Thursday evening, uh, so after the November 1 uh, little uh, non, or what should I call it, uh, lack of diversification day. Uh, the SOCGEN CT index uh, was down 0.8, so 0.8% for the month of November, down 6.91 for the year. The SOCGEN trend index down 1.88, down 9.09. Uh, or 9.08 actually for the year. And then the SOCGEN short-term traders index down 0.61 for the month of November, down 0.70 for the year. And the bridge alternatives uh, index down 1.57 for the month uh, and down 10.10. .10. The beta index I uh, left out um, on purpose because there seemed to be a technical problem on the website. So I couldn't get that data for you today. Any... Um, any final thoughts um, as we head into the last few weeks of 2018? Anything else you want to bring up today? Happy trading as usual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be your tagline. It is. <laughs> Morris, happy trading. Uh, trend is still okay, our, well, trend on... is still our friend. Yes. It is. Yes. Even though it's been less friendly this year, uh, maybe to some extent. But uh, anyways, on that note, uh, we'll wrap up this week's conversation. And as always, we hope that you enjoy these episodes as, as much as we really enjoy making them for you. And uh, of course, if you feel that you get some value from them, then uh, do please share them uh, with your friends and colleagues. And uh, we would be very grateful if you would leave us a rating and review on iTunes because their algorithm really likes those, so it helps us. Um, from Jerry, Moritz, and me, thanks so much for listening. Happy trading to you, and we look forward to being back on the, uh, this podcast with you next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.